Abai, the discovery of new truths. If you value knowledge as the highest good, each discovery of new truths will bring peace and satisfaction to your soul. Abai Kunanbayev. Candles in the heavy candlestick almost burned out and the quill was almost worn and creaking mercilessly with a sigh the teacher continued to dictate. The work of Goethe in a translation by Lermontov. Mountain peaks sleep in the darkness of the night. Right, sir. The boy in a skull cap, quickly dipping his quill in the inkwell and leaned over the paper. A picture from the past. The novice poet Abai learns how to write in Russian under the guidance of a famous writer, Fedor Dostoevsky. But is it possible? Abai, as a literary hero of Awezov, said, in learning Russian, I was a student without a teacher, but this is just a literary hero. But what happened in real life? There are countless questions in the life of the poet. This is an attempt to discover the truth. Who was Abai's first teacher of Russian literature? He asked for a Russian teacher. Where could the poet meet with Dostoevsky? Well-known last names and first names have something in common. What connected the families of Abai Kunanbayev and Shokhan Valikhanov? A lot of documents concern Kunanbay. Dostoevsky, Valikhanov, Kunanbayev. Unexpected turns of life and crossroads of fate. Abai, the discovery of new truths. Chapter 1. A Crown of Disciples The Karkali Mosque was built on the initiative of Kunanbay. It was a significant event for the whole region. It was the first time, and for a long time, the only mosque in the district. During the Soviet era, the minaret was dismantled, and there was a warehouse. And then the local house of pioneers settled here, and the walls of the former mosque heard only fervent sounds of a bugle and a drum. Kakarali, the main attraction. In 1849, Kunanbai was appointed senior sultan. Perhaps this was the first time when a person not related to Genghis Khan was elected to the highest position in the district. The house where he lived was not preserved. Kunanbai settled in a spacious wooden house with a green iron roof. The Sultan arrived in the city accompanied by numerous relatives and associates. Day and night, the houses of Kunanbai and his brother were full of interpreters and guards. Mukhtar Awezov, The Path of Abai. It's possible that Abai learned how to write the first word on paper somewhere in these places. At first he studied at the local school, which as a rule usually was opened under mosques. Kunanbai had a mullah in his village, specially for the children, but along with the children, other children of the village also studied with the mullah. A winter school for wintering, summer schools for the Jailao. Schools were nomadic, duration of study from two to five years. Children sat in a semicircle around the teacher, and there were even such an expression, a crown of students. Abai received his first knowledge from Muller Gabit Khan. The young Mullah Gabitan was a bookworm. Among his books, Abai found many interesting and useful books for himself. First of all, samples of high poetic art, Nizami, Firdusi, Nabai, Fizuli, Babura, Mukhtar Wezo, The Path of Abai. They learned the Arabic alphabet, how to count, and learned the surahs from the Quran by heart. Pupils would be extremely surprised to learn that this methodology was called the Lancaster method in Europe. First, a teacher taught the older children, and then the older children taught the younger children. It seems that Abai studied according to this kind of system. When Abai arrived at the madrasa, he was already literate. 
and not just literate. He already knew the basics of several languages. According to a well-known biography, while in Semipalatinsk, now Same, Abai secretly attended a parish school. So, by that time, could he already speak Russian? But who taught the poet the Russian language? Is it known that his father paid special attention to the establishment of a school in Karkareli? There are archived documents where Konenbai asked the administration to send them teachers of the Russian language. Kazakh boys who wish to learn Russian can also educate themselves on Russian laws and customs. From Konenbai's letter to Colonel Kleist. The teacher was sent, however, his name is now lost. Destinies intertwine in such a strange way. The grandfather of the famous General Kornilov served as an interpreter under the senior sultan. Maybe Nikolai Kornilov was Abai's first teacher of the Russian language. However, under Kunanbai, there were many people who knew the Russian language. Kunanbai understood that in the future it would be difficult without knowledge of the Russian language, especially since he saw his successor in Abai. Whatever it is, but something will come out of him. Abai is a fast learner, he's inclined to education, and his father, Kunanbai, decided to send the boy to a madrasa. But these plans almost fell through. What happened to the poet's father? How are the families of Abai and Shokan Valikhanov connected? And did Kunanbai meet with Dostoevsky? Chapter 2 Kunanbai's Case the Omsk archives in the present day. Maybe this is where the answer to one of the questions lies. Sometimes it happens that one phrase in one case can initiate a large-scale study. Of course, but in general, in any document, you can find interesting stories and events when it's impossible to take your eyes off it. It's impossible to take your eyes away from these folders either. These pages belong to a very thick case of Konon Bayoskenbaev. Mukhtar Oezov's daughter, Leila, worked with this document when she was writing a dissertation. My mother, indeed, found a lot of documents in the Omsk archive. There were a lot of documents concerning the identity of Konon Bay, and there were a lot of complaints regarding him, too. The main topic of complaints and denunciations were abuse of power. Everything is almost like in Oezov's novel. Intergeneric feuds and power struggles leading to bloody skirmishes. The senior sultan was detained, placed under arrest, and sent to Omsk. Accused of stealing cattle for an opposing tribe, he says that they decided to do this out of necessity for the theft that those people had done before. From the Kunanbai Oskanbayev's case. Some of the reports addressed to Governor General Gus Ford date back to 1854. At that time, it's already been a year since Shokan Balikhanov graduated from the Omsk Cadet Corps. He was bright and talented. After graduation, he became the adjutant to the Governor General. Shokan probably read those reports. Most likely, Gus Ford asked the adjutant about Kunanbai. The results of the Governor-General in this case were rather mild. Maybe this is the merit of Valikhanov. And also the vicissitudes of fate. When Konanbai was under arrest, Dostoevsky was in Omsk. He was sent from prison to exile in Semei in 1854. Well-known last names and first names have something in common. This is a very interesting topic for research. Could they have met? It's unlikely. Dostoevsky was a political criminal. Konanbai was simply detained, and it's unknown where he was held. But most likely, not in prison. Perhaps he was under house arrest the whole time. 
Cronenby's case was under investigation for years. It was closed due to the lack of evidence of many episodes. He was released from under supervision thanks to Chocon's father. There's such a valuable historical document that Chinggis Valenkanov bailed Konanbay Uskinbayev out. On November the 3rd, 1854, Uskinbayev was handed over to advisor Valenkanov, who made sure that Uskinbayev, departing from Omsk, would arrive directly to the Karkarali order. From Konanbay Uskinbayev's case, This suggests that both Kunanbai and Chinggis Valikhanov probably knew each other. But it seems that they not only knew each other, no one will vouch in such a difficult matter for just an acquaintance. And that means that their sons could have met too. Although they had little in common, Shokan was 10, older than Nabai, Kunanbai sent one of his sons to study in Omsk. Konanbay sent one of his sons to study in Omsk, supposedly on the advice of Chinggis Valikhanov. They mastered the wisdom of science in the cadet corps at one time. Abai's younger brother, Haliula, and Shokan's younger brother, Mahmoud. It is strange that with such close ties between the two families, no evidence was preserved about it, neither written nor oral. In the meantime, Konanbay left for Semei to take Abai to study. What kind of sciences did Abai learn in the madrasa? Where did he live and with whom did he communicate? And could Dostoevsky have been the poet's teacher? Chapter 3. Desire for a Search Semé, the middle of the 19th century. There is only one piano in the city. Everyone knows each other and any visitor to the city is an event. The Madrasa of Ahmed Riza just recently opened its doors to students. The building was preserved, however, during Abai's life. It was in a different place, in the Tatar settlement. They say that Imam Ahmed Riza was a noble person. He was wealthy and well-educated. He wrote three philosophical treatises. And many noble people from the steppe considered to enter their children there. Conan Bai too brought his son. It happened, presumably in 1855. This is the door of the time when Abai studied here. Here are the names of the children. Some letters are hard to read. Is there an autograph of Abai on this door? No, we have not found it here. Boys from 8 to 10 year old enter the school. In modern terms, the Mekteb is an elementary school. The Madrasa is middle and high school. There were two, three teachers. They were called Maduras. Some taught the Quran, some writing, some logic, some history. In addition to that, children learn such sciences as rhetoric, mathematics, geography, the basics of medicine, ancient Greek history, as well as Turkish, Arabic, and Persian languages. For about three years, Abai studied the above-mentioned sciences. Semei Madrasas provided a very good education. It's proved by the following excerpts from this journal. It says, the central points of education are Cairo, Constantinople, Bakchi Sarai, and in some way, the list is completed by Semei Palatinsk. While studying in the madrasa, Abai stood among his peers due to his mind and impeccable memory. He could quickly memorize and learn material. It's more or less clear where and what Abai studied, where he lived, with whom he talked. Names and addresses, unfortunately, were not preserved. The madrasa was not far from the student's place of residence. It was located in the same place, in the Tatar settlement. This is a Tatar settlement. The mosques have been preserved here and of course were rebuilt, but nevertheless, both one minaret and two minaret mosques survived in the Tatar settlement. 
This mosque was erected in 1840 at the expense of the merchant Tinibai Karpenov. He lived not far from it. Kunanbai and Tininbai were in-laws. He married his daughter to Tininbai's son. So the noble bey more than once sat in the dastakhan of the Semei's merchant. Most likely, Abai lived with someone from his relatives or acquaintances, and from there, he went to madrasas. But who was it? There's no reliable information either. Usually, the sons of Konanbai lived at Tinibai's house. I was of rights that the main character of this novel stayed in the house more than once. It's logical to assume that the real Abai lived here, well, or at least visited this place more than once. The house of postman Lipuhin. Here Dostoevsky settled after his marriage. So we went through a small dining room, and from the dining room there's a door to the bedroom, then from there to the living room. From the living room there's a door to the study. But first the writer rented rooms in another house, which allegedly was not far from the madrasa. It's known that Fyodor Dostoevsky visited the Tatar settlement more than once with his friend Alexander Wrangel. Wrangel, holding the post of district attorney, went to visit someone, a prosperous Tatar merchant, and often invited them to his home. They were happy if he visited them. Well, on few occasions, he took Dostoevsky with him. He also visited Tinibai, a relative of Kunanbai. Our friends, rich people, Mendibai and Tinibai, were glad to welcome us. We drank fresh kumas, ate fresh mutton, rock-hard cheese, pilaf with lamb and smoked meat of a young foal. Alexander Wrangel. Tinibai even sent a parcel to his friend Dostoevsky in St. Petersburg after Fedor Mikhailovich left. Did they meet at this house, Abai and Dostoevsky? In addition, Shokan often visited Tinibai more than once when he was in Semei. And another thing. The oldest temple is the Naminsky Cathedral. It was the very first stone cathedral in our city. Dostoevsky went to this cathedral. It didn't survive to this day, neither did the church or the school that operated under it and where Abai allegedly went to study. The question is, how could a boy, alone without recommendations, enter a parish school? Maybe someone helped him. Valikhanov, Wrangel, Dostoevsky, or someone else his father might have known. Semei of the early 19th century with only 9,000 residents, the majority of them knew each other in person. Another place on the map, another point of contact with Abai's fate. The merchant, Mirkoban Ayupov, lived in this house and he helped Valikhanov to go on his famous trip to Kashgar. So Shokan Valikhanov was in this house? Well, yes, of course. Fedor Mikhailovich and I went to a very rich old man. His name was Bukash. He was a man of about 70, nimble with a fox-like face. Bukash brought a young, apparently fifth wife from Kokand, and now he wanted to brag about her and show her off and invited us to Dastakhan. Alexander Rangel. The house has long been destroyed. There was only information that Bukash, the so-called Mikurban, was one of the close friends of Konanbai. Prosecutor Wrangel could meet with the most volost ruler, Konanbai, on business affairs. Maybe Abai was visiting with his father. Wrangel then lived in the house of the merchant Stepanov. Originally, the house of the merchant Stepanov consisted of this building with square windows. Here, the two windows following this colonnade. Dostoevsky could easily have come to the house of Wrangel, even in the absence of his master. Often, literary readings were arranged in this house. Dostoevsky was an excellent reader. When Dostoevsky arrived here, the future great Kazakh poet was nine years old. In the year of Dostoevsky's departure, he was 14. For a poet, the age from nine to 14 is already a time for creativity. Could the boy once have heard under the windows how someone in a hoarse voice read Pushkin's poem, The Prophet? Irina Stelkova.
The fact that they could have met at least by chance is very high, but could Dostoevsky have been a Abai's teacher? For the past decade, researchers have been trying to answer this question, but there's no documentary evidence of the version, only assumptions. Dostoevsky was not exactly the first teacher of Russian literature for Abai, for a simple reason he didn't know the Kazakh language. However, the exiled writer was in great need of money and really earned money in semi-palatinsk with lessons. And this lack of money haunted him constantly. Tinibai could well advise his relative to allow Dostoevsky to teach Abai, a friend of the district attorney as a suitable teacher for the son of an influential Konunbai. But unfortunately, there's no source material or documents that can prove it. Someday I'll write you about Semipalatinsk, Dostoevsky promised his brother, but he never did. There are no detailed memories of the city, its residents or its meetings. And apparently a picture from the past where the writer dictates words in a hoarse voice to a boy in a skullcap will remain an unconfirmed fantasy. Abai Konanbaev, being certainly a contemporary of Fyodor Dostoevsky, knew and heard a lot about him, and everything has coincided in time that is impossible not to presume that Abai met with Fyodor Dostoevsky. And there's still a mystery. Valikhanov, Dostoevsky, Konanbaev. There was so much connecting them, they even lived in the same city and at one time. Has Abai never talked about this? Mokhtar Ovezov made no mention. In the memory of the people, there are also no traditions. Why? Epilogue. Know yourself. Man is the whole world, and if you want to comprehend the universe, first, you need to know yourself. Abai Konanbaev. Major novels of the writer were published in the Russian Bulletin, the magazine, which Konanbaev regularly took in the library, and in the memoirs of the poet, Dostoevsky is mentioned only in the list of the authors that Abai read, and no other comments. The reason may be that Dostoevsky was forbidden at the time. Perhaps the answer is that most of the memoirs of Abai were published in Soviet times. My mother once told me, you are the great-grandson of Fyodor Dostoevsky, a Russian writer, when I was little. But don't talk too much about it, because it was difficult times, because he was a reactionary writer. Lenin called him a super-malicious writer. And Abai obviously knew about Shokhan Valikhanov. Only the memories of him, an officer and an aristocrat, were also not encouraged for some time. If you look closely at the creative heritage of Abai, of course, you can find notes and, in general, whole passages similar to the worldview of Dostoevsky. Man is a secret. It must be solved. I study the secret because I want to be a human being, wrote Dostoevsky. This is so in tune with the words of Abai. Look into the soul deeper, stay alone with yourself. I am a mystery to you.